There was an excellent article by Richard Cohen in the Washington Post called Bravo Ruthie, and it was about the hung jury in the Tycho trial. Well, actually not a hung jury. It was hung, but before they finally declared that a mistrial, they declared it a mistrial because one of the jurors had gotten a threatening letter. She'd been Her name had been exposed in the Post. But most important, the other jurors were upset because they wanted to vote Dennis Kozlowski guilty, and she did not think that he had been proven guilty, and so she was a holdout. And Cohen says, he refers to her, her name is Ruth Jordan. And he said, quote, Jordan's swellness is documented by her admitted willingness to have hung the Tycho jury simply because she felt the government had failed to prove criminal intent. The prosecution certainly proved that Kozlowski was a pig, a CEO who had used company funds to throw his wife a $2 million birthday party, and had spent $6,000 for a shower curtain. These excesses, so excessive that the word is insufficient, made Koslovsky the poster boy for corporate greed, and casting directors take note, someone who looked the part. All this made it all the harder for the brave Mrs. Jordan to say no. Quote, I feel very strongly that even ugly people deserve justice, unquote, Jordan told the New York Times and CBS News. Quote, even people who have bad habits deserve justice. People who have repellent lifestyles, even greedy people if they are greedy, even people who have so much they don't know how to spend it and still want more. Even they deserve justice when it comes to whether or not they committed a crime. End of quote. And Cohen goes on to say, those words may be translated into, into Latin, ought to be carved above the entranceway of every courthouse in the nation. And that was Richard Cohen in the Washington Post. On my website, harrybrown.org, there is a page that you can see right at the top of the home page. You can go right to it from there. Links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. And the entire Richard Cohen article is on that web page. And Remember last week I mentioned that every time somebody mentions the, the Tycho trial, they always use the expression that Dennis Kozlowski looted the company of $600 million. But the fact is that Kozlowski has not been proven guilty yet. No jury has decided he's guilty yet. He claims that he was given permission to appropriate all the money that he used supposedly for himself or his art collection and his wife's birthday party and so on. And the reason we have trials in America is to find out what the truth is. If we didn't have those trials, if we didn't need them, all we'd have to do is to call up Bill O'Reilly and let Bill O'Reilly tell us who's innocent and who's guilty. But thank goodness in America, even the most unsavory people should not be convicted of a crime they didn't commit, and so we have trials to find that out. Meanwhile, we have some interesting things that have come up about the war in Iraq. There's an excellent article by Lou Rockwell, which is also linked on my website, and you can get the whole article there. But let me just give you three paragraphs from it. Quote, Hans Blix, the former U.N. chief weapons inspector, broke the taboo and said what nearly everyone was already thinking but refusing to say. On balance, Iraq was better off under Saddam Hussein. On one level, this is perfectly obvious and probably doesn't need to be said at all. And yet it does need to be said because the neoconservatives have continued to insist that anything and everything can be justified because Saddam was so evil. It's not true, of course, that any ends justify the means. And yet we could go further and state what most all Iraqis have concluded. Saddam Hussein was awful, but the occupation is worse. The pro-American people who are within Iraq ought never to tire of pointing out that this was not America at war with Iraq, but the Bush administration on a maniacal mission that never would have gone ahead if the regime had any respect for the Constitution. In its founding and history, America represents freedom and peaceful commercial engagement. The actions of a junta in control of the White House should not be permitted to poison the glories of American institutions and history. For American citizens who feel themselves demoralized by defeat, they need to hear a similar message. The actions of the Bush administration and its disastrous war are not the actions of our country as such. It was a few misguided fanatics who do not have an appreciation for the value of freedom. They use the events of 9-11 to live out their ambitions to expand, to expand the hegemon. As Condoleezza Rice once again admitted in her testimony, quote, bold and comprehensive changes are sometimes only possible in the wake of catastrophic events, events which create a new consensus that allows us to transcend old ways of thinking and acting. End of quote, and end of the excerpt from Lou Rockwell's article. And as I said, that's linked on my website. What Condoleezza Rice was saying was that that catastrophe may be a blessing in disguise because it allowed us to get rid of the old thinking that said we can't just go out and bomb any old country and conquer any old country. We need to learn how to be a true superpower. But no matter how bad things have become over there, no matter how bad it has become in Iraq, no matter how many Americans get killed there, there are always people who want more people killed. This past week, uh, Joseph Farah on World Net Daily said that now the answer as a result of what happened in Fallujah 
this past week where four Americans were killed and then mutilated and people celebrated over their death? The answer is to go flatten Kalusia, bomb it, shoot ballistic missiles in it. And he says, quote, we should not try to gain an international consensus for this action. We should not apologize for it. We should not restrain our air force and artillery batteries from wreaking devastation. We should not expose our ground troops to unnecessary risks. In other words, we may need to flatten Fallujah. We may need to destroy it. We may need to grind it, pulverize it, and salt the soil as the Romans did with troublesome enemies. Quite frankly, we need to make an example out of Fallujah. Here is a chance for a justice. Here is an opportunity to show the people of the Middle East that doesn't pay to resort to barbarism and terrorism. Hmm, I wonder who it is that's resorting to barbarism and terrorism. Anyway, he goes on to say, immediately the U.S. should stop its humanitarian efforts in Fallujah. There should be no more food caravans. Instead, we should isolate the city and cut off its supplies and its power. It should be a city under siege. And then he points out that uh, in there, there is graffiti on the walls that says it's permitted to steal from Americans. It's permitted to kill Americans for vengeance. And he cites that as an example of how depraved those people are. And here he is saying that it is permitted to kill Iraqis for vengeance. But that's the way it goes. Uh, just a few more citations from Joseph Farrar's article on World Net Daily this past week, and this also is linked on my website. He says, quote, it's time to take off the velvet gloves. It's time to stop being Mr. Nice Guy. It's time to cease worrying about collateral damage. It's time to show all Iraqis and their brothers and sisters throughout the Middle East that it doesn't pay to mess with Americans. They need to see there is no profit in it. They need to understand we mean business. They need to accept things will never be the same in Iraq. They need to feel the heat. They need to be provided with visible disincentives to further attacks on Americans, free Iraqis, and other coalition partners. Sometimes the most merciful course of action seems like the harshest. Fallujah needs to feel some pain. If this operation is carried out well and with finality, it may save many more Iraqis, Americans, and others from future pain. Well, Mr. Farrar... I guess you think that America's been operating with a velvet glove up to this point, being Mr. Nice Guy, and I'm sure the families of those 10 to 20,000 Iraqis who have already died over there must think that, gee, America has been merciful. America has been so soft-hearted about all this. It is funny. No matter how badly force turns out, no matter how many times force produces terrible results, like the reactions that are happening in Iraq to American occupation, no matter how badly it all turns out, the answer always is more and more force. We didn't show enough force. And it always turns out the same, that all the force does is to produce retaliation, a reaction of force from the other side. And the interesting thing is that four Americans died. That's four too many. But the reason that they died was because they were where they didn't belong, where the American government sent them that they shouldn't have been. And the result is that we should bring the troops home. But what will happen if Mr. Farrar's ideas are carried out by the government, and we don't know whether they will, is that probably another hundred Americans will die to avenge the deaths of four. It's very interesting that before the First World War, for the three years of the First World War before the United States got into it, the Germans declared a war zone around the British Isles. The Germans had the submarine, which the Allies did not, and the German submarines were sinking ships that would bring supplies to Britain. Some Americans got on ships that went to Britain, and they, those ships were sunk by the submarines, and Wilson protested loudly. He never protested about the British blockade that was keeping food from getting into German, Germany and causing Germans to starve to death, but he did complain about the sinking of munition ships that were going to Britain from America. By the time the United States declared war in April of 1917, on the justification that it could no longer tolerate and had to react and had to, for justice, fight against these attacks by German submarines, by that time, 197 Americans had died. They had been warned by Germans not to be on those ships, but they went on anyway, and they died. And so to avenge the deaths of 197 people, America went to war. And 116,516 Americans died in that war. But boy, we showed them, didn't we? We showed them they couldn't mess with America. We showed them that we weren't going to allow them to tell us who could be on ships and who couldn't. That we weren't going to let them tell us that we couldn't carry munitions to the British and that we couldn't sail into war zones unmolested. We showed them. 116,516 Americans died to teach the Germans a lesson. So far, 600 Americans have died to teach Iraq a lesson. And every new lesson that the neoconservatives, the warmongers, the hawks, whatever you want to call them, want to teach somebody in the world is going to cost the deaths of more Americans. And you know what the outcome is going to be? The outcome is going to be that things are just going to get worse. Afghanistan is no safer today than it was before the Americans moved in. In fact, it's a lot less safe because there was no civil war in Afghanistan before 2001. Iraq was not a scene of death and destruction before the Americans moved in. Yes, Saddam Hussein was a bad dictator, but he was not killing people on the street because they were being issued orders in English that they couldn't understand. He was not ringing the towns with barbed wire. 
he was not causing people to carry ID cards and stop at checkpoints and roadblocks, and, and there were not shootings and, and all kinds of firings back and forth on the streets where innocent people were getting caught in the crossfire. Yes, it was a bad government. It was a bad place to be. But it's an even worse place now that it's occupied by foreign power. Do you, what do you think Americans would act? How would they feel if America was occupied by Chinese troops, shouting instructions in Chinese to people and then shooting people who didn't respond? This is no way to live for us. It's no way to live for them. We shouldn't be in a world afraid of what the world is going to do to us and the world afraid what America is going to do to it. I said before the break that I'd tell you an interesting story about World War II. I should have said I'll tell you a story about World War II, and then you could decide whether or not it was interesting. But the story is this, that at the, near the beginning of World War II, the Germans, the Nazis, overran France, and they finally drove the French army and the French forces out of France. Many of them evacuated France at Dunkirk with the British, went to Britain, and then one way or another, the French, what they called the Free French, um, found, uh, made their way to Algeria and other northern Africa colonies of France, colonies that France won in World War I, and set up some resistance there. But the government of France officially surrendered to the Germans, and the Germans did not have to have too many troops in France because the French government was willing to enforce the occupation for the Germans. And they set up a new government, which uh, had the former capital had been Paris and is again now, of course. But they set it up in the town of Vichy, B-I-C-H-Y, same place they make the water. And so it was known for thereafter in the Second World War as the Vichy government of France. Now, the point is this, that the Nazis really controlled the country. They handpicked a government there to run the country. And it was a Nazi occupation under the de facto control, supposedly, of French people who ran the Vichy government. While this was going on, however, through the rest of the Second World War, there were resistors, all kinds of resistors, who sabotaged, who blew up buildings, who blew up power stations, who did anything they could to disrupt the Germans that were there and to create as much havoc in France as possible. These people were known as the resistance, and they have gone down in history not as the resistance, but as the heroic, courageous resistance that resisted the Nazis. They are enshrined in our history books as wonderful, patriotic French people who fought back against the Nazis, who refused to let their country be occupied by a foreign power. Now, do you notice any parallel between that and what's going on in Iraq today? George Bush says, see, these people don't want freedom. These people hate freedom. You know, <laughs> and as Charlie Reese said, that doesn't make any sense at all. Can you imagine somebody saying, suddenly standing up and saying, you know, I hate freedom. I think I'll go out and blow myself up. And, and it is really ridiculous that these people supposedly hate freedom, and that's why they're doing all these terrible things in Iraq to Americans and so forth. No, they don't hate freedom. They hate Americans for what Americans have done. Whether they hate America is another story. Most of those people around the world who are so upset with us do not really hate America. They hate what our government has done, and we should hate what our government has done too. Our government has created havoc around the world over the last 50 years. Our government has upset democratically elected governments, engineered coups that have displaced governments that were selected by the people. Our government has installed dictators who have conducted tyrannical regimes. Our government has sent foreign aid in the form of money and weapons and everything and training even for governments that are oppressing their people. They did it in Vietnam. They did it in South Korea. They did it in Indonesia. They have done it today in Pakistan. They're doing it in Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. Countries all over the world that are suffering from tyrannical governments are getting foreign aid from the United States. Mer Americans are not aware of this. Americans are surprised when somebody gets upset with America because they don't realize what their own government is doing. But I can assure you that the peoples in these countries that are suffering so badly know that America has a lot to do with it, and they do not forget. There is one answer to all of this, and it is the same answer over and over and over again, but it doesn't change. The answer is we've got to get American troops out of these countries. We've got to stop letting our government use our taxpayer money to prop up dictatorial regimes around the world. It is time for our government to get out of all these countries to close the 705 military bases they have in foreign countries. The only reason those bases are there is supposedly to get the jump on other countries before they attack us. Well, nobody in the world would want to attack us if we were not a threat to anybody. Why in the world are the terrorists attacking America, or why did they attack America on 9-11 and the other occasions when they don't attack Switzerland? They don't attack a number of countries who are just as free as America, probably pretty close to being as prosperous, certainly Switzerland is as prosperous, and certainly as democratic as America. George Bush's rationale makes no sense whatsoever. These people do not hate us for our freedoms, our democracy, or our prosperity. They hate us because we're a bunch of meddling, busybody bullies 
who are going around the world throwing America's military weight around. This is not just true of George W. Bush. It was true of Bill Clinton. It was true of George H. W. Bush. It was true of Ronald Reagan. It was true of Richard Nixon, Lyndon Johnson, John F. Kennedy, Dwight Eisenhower, and Harry Truman, and certainly true of Franklin Roosevelt, and certainly true of William McKinley and Woodrow Wilson. Perhaps the only president in the last 50 years who did not step up America's intrusions in foreign countries was Jimmy Carter, which does not make him a good president. He was as bad as the rest of them. He was using the power of government to take from some people and give to others. He was using the power of government to impose his personal taste on us and parts of the rest of the world. But at least he did not expand it. Every president since them and every since him and every president before him, going back to Franklin Roosevelt, used the power of the presidency to expand America's intrusions around the world. It is not a coincidence that the Iranian terrorists in 1979 went to the U.S. Embassy and captured what was it, a hundred American employees there, and held them hostage for over a year. It was the American embassy where the coup began in 1953 that overthrew the democratically elected government of Iran. And it was now over 40 years later, pardon me, over 25 years later, that the hostage-taking took place. Americans had no recollection or any, even maybe never had any knowledge of the coup that had taken place in Iran. But the Iranians knew, and they did not forget, and they were very, very eager to impose some kind of pain and suffering on the United States. And they did. The Nightline program, which has now been on for over 20 years, began during the hostage period. And it was on every night to give the latest report on the hostage taking. And when the hostages were finally freed, they decided to keep the show on the air, called it Nightline, and it's there today. But America was riveted by all this. And as usual, nothing was ever said that I recall during that period, that I saw during that period, to explain why the Iranians were so upset. No, it was not right for them to kidnap and take these people, these employees of the embassy, and cause them pain and suffering. No, that was not right. But if you do not understand what motivated these people, what gave them the support of the Iranian people behind them, you are just setting up other Americans someplace to suffer the same thing. And because it is never discussed, because foreign policy was never an issue, it was never debated by Democrats or Republicans, no matter which party had Congress, no matter which party had the White House, it meant that the Iranian hostage uh, taking was followed by the blowing up of the Marines in Lebanon, followed by the Lockerbie uh, disaster where the Pan American plane was shot down, followed by the two World Trade Center incidents, and on and on and on. And because it is never discussed what could possibly be causing these things, no remedy is ever offered in any seriousness by any ranking politician in this country. It is time to start asking the right questions. Last week I discussed on this show the fact that it seems that always, on TV and in the news, they are always asking the wrong questions. Was Martha Stewart lying? When it should be, what's the matter with insider trading in the first place? Who was possibly hurt by it? In the Tycho thing, always was the looting of Tycho by Kozlowski. Is that uh, his conviction going to send a message to other corporate raiders? It was never asked, was he really guilty in the first place? And in the 9-11 commission, they're asking, is Richard Carr correct, or is the administration correct in saying that he's just an opportunistic individual who's trying to sell books, when the real question is, what caused the 9-11 attackers to give their lives willingly to blow up the World Trade Center and send a message to America? The wrong questions are always asked. I expanded that commentary of last week into an article, and it's on my website now. If you go to harrybrown.org, you can read it. And at the end of that article, I quote a statement by Thomas Pynchon that he wrote in his novel Gravity's Rainbow. If they can get you to ask the wrong questions, then it doesn't really matter what the answers are. They don't care what the answers are as long as you're asking the wrong questions. And as long as we preoccupy ourselves with the question of whether Richard Clark is telling the truth or whether he really was a Bush supporter who decided he could sell more books by being anti-Bush, then it doesn't matter what the answer is. It doesn't matter whether Clark is right or Condoleezza Rice is right. They are discussing the wrong issue. The issue is why do people hate America so much around the world? Why do they hate our government so much? What is our government doing to bring this about? Well, let's find out what people in the real world are thinking. Larry in California, thanks for hanging on so long while I run off at the mouth. We've got about one minute before the break, so why don't you get us started, and then we'll finish this up after the break. Well, you were talking about TV shows that are asking the wrong questions, and actually I was calling in with one TV show that is asking the right questions pretty much every single time, and it's not The Daily Show with John Stewart. I don't know if you saw them this week, but they were very Wonderful. much against Ruth uh, and uh, very much for the conviction of the Tycho case. 
but this is a TV show on Showtime by Penn & Teller, and it's an expose show that is wonderful, and I look forward to telling you about it after the break. Terrific. Right. And before the break, Larry mentioned that there was a show that was asking the right questions, and it's Penn & Teller on Showtime. Unfortunately, I don't get Showtime, but again, for people who don't know, uh, Penn & Teller are mu musicians, magicians, very good magicians. I was very fortunate two years ago when I was in Las Vegas to be able to see their show, and it was outstanding. I would recommend it to anybody. And they are also very, very, very strong libertarians and have from time to time spoken out very strongly on behalf of the libertarian position. Is that show on weekly, monthly, what? Well, um, they make 12 episodes a year, it seems, mm -hmm. and um, they show one new episode a week. So I think we're going to get uh, – we just got the second episode of the second season this week. So, I think so we you got ten more weeks in a row that it will be on. Right. And, and they what, show reruns um, a lot. And sure. And while what, the show's on, they show it like five times a week. Right. So if you get showtime, then look in your cable guide or look in the TV guide and just keep scurrying around on the evening uh, lineup until you see Penn and Teller there and uh, check in on it. Now, what what are they saying, Larry? Well, the, first of all, the name of the show, um, I'm not sure if I can actually say the name of the show on this fine radio network. <laughs> Probably not if I know Penn Gillette. The name of the show is Penn and Teller BS, and uh -huh. they don't uh, abbreviate that. I see. Um, they, it's, it's, there's a long history of magicians debunking things because they're public figures and they understand how scams work. Yes. Um, so, like, you know, James Randi, who's one of the idols of Penn and Teller and should be the idol of everybody. Um, so this is a debunking show. It's an expose show. Um, so they go after things like um, uh, talking to the dead or Ouija boards. But they also go after things like in, uh, hysteria over the environment, over secondhand smoke, over um, uh, fad diets. Um, and uh, this week's episode is on safety hysteria, and it's one of the most vital pieces of TV I've seen in a while. If you're if you're sensitive to libertarian arguments, you can you can notice them go by. Most people may not realize it, but at one point they say that that um, the press and the government use hysteria over things like terrorism to railroad the public into uh, into the things that those edifices want to happen. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it was, oh, it's excellent. It's a half hour show, and they tackle one subject basically every week. Um, and um, it's, uh, like I said, we're only in week two. Uh, this safety episode is going to be shown. I don't know, uh, two or three more times. I think it's actually on right now. <laughs> It'll be on in another three hours as well on Showtime. Really? Well, I wonder if I can get uh, Showtime added to my cable channels within the next three hours. I'll have to call Monday morning and get it lined up. Well, you, you've got another couple of chances this week before it uh, goes off the air. Uh, the other thing, too, is that the first season, uh, which was on last April, um, is already out on DVD, and you can buy that at Amazon, and um, it has extras and deleted scenes and all sorts of interesting information. Well, that's terrific. What you said about magicians exposing things is very good when Yuri Geller was very popular with his spoon bending and starting your watches working again over the television, you know, all these uh, crazy tricks, and he invited scientists to come and check him out to prove that what he was doing was real, that there were no tricks or artifice. And, of course, James Randi, who you mentioned, who is a magician, said, that's ridiculous. Scientists can't be expected to be able to figure out how he's deceiving you. What you should do is to invite magicians to come, because magicians know how tricks are perpetrated. And so the magicians did finally check him out and prove that the guy was a fraud. But his fraud got past the scientists. Now, the relevance of that is that you have so many scientists, supposed, who are saying that global warming is real. You have so many scientists and, and people uh, that are supposedly experts who will tell you that Iraq is a real threat and so forth. And it really does take people like Penn and Teller or James Randi or others to be able to see through these deceptions. And so those are perhaps the people we should be paying the most attention to. Larry, I'm always glad to hear from you. You always have something interesting to add. So please check in from time to time and keep us informed. Well, for something a little bit brighter, let's go to Massachusetts and talk to Kayleen. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello. Thank you so much for waiting and staying on the phone with us. What's on your mind tonight? Hi, Mr. Brown. Hello there. I just there. wanted to say I love your show. I've been uh, listening to you for a long time. And I couldn't agree with you more about uh, the U.S. bullying other countries and uh, basically helping out and causing dictatorships. And uh, also, I'd like to say, what's up with this other parties, the, the two major parties, being able to take millions of our tax dollars and use them for their campaigns, and yet I can't give you more than $2,000 or you or any other third-party campaign. And that's because you're not a government. <laughs> exactly. It's ridiculous. Yes, it is. And you know, the funny thing, too, is that before Watergate, there really was no discussion of campaign finance. There were no scandals about great big gobs of money going from somebody into a presidential campaign or a congressman's campaign and causing corruption and this, that, and the other thing. The stories that came out every once in a great while were very, very mild. So in the wake of Watergate, they passed the first campaign finance laws. That's when they first limited uh, contributions to a presidential campaign to $1,000 and put in all of these reporting requirements. Before then, you could give cash to a campaign. They didn't have to keep track of it. You could give money anonymously. You could do anything you wanted. They could spend the money in any way they wanted. But once they passed the first law, from then on, 
every campaign, every single election, seem to have all kinds of charges and countercharges about campaign finance scandals. And so they keep amending the law, they keep expanding the law, they keep doing this and that. And, of course, it just gets worse and worse. And it's the same old thing that government just keeps coming back every year telling us there's a problem and they need new legislation with new money, new restrictions on us in order to solve that problem. And then they come back next year because the problem is even worse now, so they need even more money, they need to put more restrictions on us and so on. Precisely. And then they have a nerve to ask me on uh, my W-2 form, or uh, I'm sorry, the 1040 form. Sure. Uh, do you want to contribute one dollar? <laughs> oh, it's three dollars. Three dollars. It's three dollars now. I can see oh, you're, you're so disgusted you don't pay attention. <laughs> I want to pay two thousand dollars to Harry Brown. By the way, I voted for you in two thousand. Well, thank you. And you can still send the check now if you like. But <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think I'm going to do? What are you going to do? If I win the lottery, which I hope to do soon, I'm going to give two thousand dollars to everybody I know and say, send it to the Libertarian. To whoever uh, the Libertarian candidate turns out to absolutely. be. Absolutely. Well, that's a good idea. Presidential candidates. State candidate, whoever. You can give up to you can give up to ten thousand dollars in one year to anybody you want, as to as many people as you want, without paying any gift tax on it. So mm -hmm. it would be a way mm -hmm. to get contributions in. And right. of course, uh, that'll be something that John McCain or somebody else <laughs> next year will bring up and say, "This woman, Kayleen in Massachusetts, has circumvented the law. We need to, we need to expand the law, and be, so we can put people like Kayleen in jail." <laughs> <laughs> Let him put me in jail as long as a libertarian becomes president. <laughs> All right, boy, that's great, Kayleen. Thanks so much for calling. All right, thanks for your time. You bet. Good night. Good night. Before we go to the next phone call, I did want to mention when Larry called about Penn and Teller, he mentioned offhand the John Stewart Daily Show and that the fact this past week they've been talking about Condoleezza Rice's testimony and so on. There is a show that does ask the right questions sometimes, and I tell you, they skewer politicians in a nonpartisan way, and they don't do it in a superficial way. They don't get down to all the questions that you or I might ask, but they certainly point out the inconsistencies and the hypocrisies and so on in so many ways and do it with humor. And yet that humor is so pointed that anybody watching that show can't miss the fact that a point is being made here, that something substantial is being said about what these politicians are telling us. So I would certainly recommend that show to anyone. I should point out that they use a lot of foul language on it, but they bleep it all. <laughs> so the fact is that on any given half-hour show, you're going to hear beep about five or six times. But you will not hear the actual words, so if you want to have your children watching, I guess it's all right. But about half the show is devoted to politics, and it's very funny. It's on the comedy channel, which is not on everybody's cable system, but it's not a premium channel. So it may be that it comes as part and parcel of your basic cable package that you have with a local cable supplier. All right, let's go now from Massachusetts all the way down to Florida and talk with Doris. Good evening, Doris. Good evening, sir. I have to tell you I agree with you 100% of what you said about George Bush. But what choice do we have, Mr. Kerry? No, thank you. I mean, come on. Oh, you don't like John Kerry? You don't want to have a national health care system? You don't don't want all our problems to be solved by government? Uh, what kind of a person are you? The least government we have, the better it is, the way I feel. Like, I've been a uh, Republican. 35 years, I went and I changed my voting record. I went independent. So what do I do now? I'm still waiting for someone that I can say, well, I'll vote for. Yeah, I know it's, it's not easy, but here is my suggestion for whatever it's worth, and you, of course, have to make up your own mind. But I would suggest... First of all, you consider voting libertarian because the nice thing about a libertarian is that even though he's not going to get elected, you know that nobody can misinterpret your vote. If you vote for Kerry because you're so fed up with Bush, Kerry's going to say, oh, they want my national health care plan. If you vote for Bush because you are scared to death of Kerry, then Bush is going to say, see, they endorse my bombing country, so I'll go bomb a few more. But if you vote libertarian, nobody's going to interpret that as a vote for more government. And if you don't feel up to voting libertarian, then the, then the other possibility is don't vote at all because it only encourages them. I will go libertarian. <laughs> okay. Uh, and and now in Florida, they finally got rid of some of the really bad ballot access laws. So there probably is going to be a libertarian running for Congress and the state house in your district there. So you might take a look to the candidates that are on the ballot when you get your sample ballot, and you'll probably see a lot of libertarians running in Florida. So good luck to you, Doris. And if, uh, if do you have anything else you want to add before you go? No, I'm just worried about the voting. I hear it's really fixed. There's well, no paper trail. There's no question that we're not going to get liberty this year. But if we start by not supporting the people who are making government bigger, the people who are creating all these problems for America around the world, if we start by just withholding our support from, the, from them, we're actually doing something positive. And that's the first step. And it, I can't emphasize enough that that is the important first step because they are thriving on our votes. When you're voting for the lesser of two evils, they thrive on that. They say, ah, this is an endorsement for me. I can do anything I want. And just withholding the vote. And someday we're going to be able to harness all those people who aren't voting and be able to... Uh, let them be a voice for something very, very positive instead of just withholding support. They will be able to demand liberty. And I am not optimistic in the sense that I can tell you in the next 10 years we're going to turn this around, oh. but I am hopeful. I can see how it can happen, so I'm just hoping it does happen, and I'm hoping it happens soon. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. And let's go now to Pittsburgh and talk with Rob. Good evening, Rob. Hello, Harry Brown. 
you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of your show, and uh, you're making a lot of good points. Like, I agree with what you're saying about if we had Chinese troops uh, shouting orders at us in Chinese, how would we act on the street? But um, I don't know. It's, it's funny. I, I've been listening to these conservative talk shows uh, uh, in Pittsburgh. I wish you could be on the air every day. I mean, Neil Bortz is on, but he sounds like a, he doesn't even sound like a libertarian these days. He just sounds like a conservative to me. I mean, all these guys, there's like Sean Hannity and Jim Quinn and Glenn Beck and Neil Bortz, and they're all very interesting and entertaining, but they're all very hawkish, you know? Sure. And um, they, uh, the thing is that they tend to be really obnoxious sometimes, and they interrupt people, and they, and they don't seem to have a whole lot of tolerance for anybody that doesn't agree with them. <laughs> and so you're a real gentleman by comparison. I wish there was more shows like yours on the air. And another thing is that, you know, the, I basically agree with these people when they attack liberals or criticize liberals, and then I'm in agreement with them, but it's the same old thing in the media where, I bet most people don't know that there's alternatives to being liberal or conservative. People think that's all there is because that's all they're exposed to in the media, you know. Yes. And um, but the thing is that I'm not sure. I'm just I don't know. When I listen to them, they make sense, and then I listen to you, and you make sense, and you're saying things that are very different from what they're saying. And I'm thinking maybe you have part of the picture, and they have part of the picture, and maybe the truth is just a lot more complicated. Well, Rob, let me interrupt you because we're going to have to take a break now. But while we're on the break, why don't you see if you can think of a good example of somewhere that you think they may have the right picture and where I may be incomplete. All right, Rob, when uh, we were talking before, you said that there might be some cases where the conservative talk show hosts have the right angle and other cases where somebody like me might have the right angle, and I suggested that you give some thought during the break to an example of one area where they might have the right insight. Can you think of a good example? Well, here's, here's what I'm saying. I'm not, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that I think you have part of the truth that, needs, that people need to understand, but maybe there's some truth to what there's like. Maybe they have part of the truth also. And uh, an example would be this business of do the terrorists hate our freedom or do they hate freedom and this sort of thing. Well, the thing is that you make a lot of good points. I do agree with you that our foreign policy is insane and has been insane for a long time, and the insanity has to stop. But um, I don't, I'm thinking, okay, I think it's well known that the United States plans to pull out of Iraq in June, and there's supposed to be a, an Iraqi constitution that goes into effect that allows for elections but protects the rights of minorities. And I think that some of these people who are fighting um, against the Americans in Iraq can't stand that idea because they want power for their particular group. They don't want a, a situation where... Uh, the maybe minorities are protected or, or there's these sort of things. And, I mean, I just think if you look at the whole history of radical Islam and, and groups like the Taliban, they, they do hate freedom. They, they can't stand for a woman to show any skin while she's walking the streets or, you know, these sort of things. So I, I don't exactly see these people as freedom. I, I think there's insanity on both sides, our foreign policy and their extremism. You know what I'm saying? Sure, I understand it, but there are a number of things that should be noted here. First of all, the United States is not planning to pull out on June 30th, and any time anybody suggests that, Donald Rumsfeld or... Dick Cheney or George Bush makes it very clear that that's not the case, that all they're going to do is to hand over uh, nominal control of the government to Iraqis, but the United States is already setting up several military bases in Iraq, and they are certainly not going to let the Iraqis do whatever they want. There is no chance that Iraq is going to be a completely self-governing nation, and a number of people associated with the administration have said that we're going to have to be in Iraq for five and ten years, and some people are saying 20 or 30 years, that yeah. Americans are going to have to be there to watch over this, and this is what they think of as democracy, and that is that you can vote for whatever you want as long as it doesn't contradict what we want for you. And, yeah. as, and as far as wanting freedom is concerned, yes, in some cases what they want is freedom to oppress others, but they certainly are not objecting to the idea that the United States is a free country, if we really are a free country. I mean, nobody's going to go out and sacrifice his life to protest the fact that the United States is a democracy or is prosperous or is a free country. I mean, people do give their lives for their own country, but somebody uh, running an airplane into the World Trade Center is not giving his life for his country, he's got to be doing it for something much, much more than just protesting American freedom. And the idea that George Bush can say, or that John Hannity or Bill O'Reilly can say that these people hate freedom, I mean, it is just absolutely ridiculous. They're not going to go out and fight and give their lives just because they, they don't like the way the United States operates in the United States. They don't like what the United States is doing in Iraq, and that's why they're fighting. Now, that doesn't mean that they're using the right means. It doesn't mean that I would support them or that I would endorse what they're doing, but it, it means that George Bush is trying to divert our attention to something that doesn't exist to make it an issue of something that we can all agree on that has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on over there. Yeah, I think I, I see what you're saying. But, well, before you go on to your next caller, I just wanted to let you know something funny, though. On April 1st, Sean Hannity did something pretty funny on his show. He, uh, I tuned in just a few minutes after it started, and I'm hearing him saying things like, you know, I, I think capitalism has failed. And I tried, did I, just hear, <laughs> did I just hear Sean Hannity say that capitalism isn't working? And then he started saying that he's thinking that he, uh, socialism is the way to go, and he's not going to vote for Bush, he's going to vote for Kerry. And it, it, within a minute, I was like, oh, it's April 1st. So, you know, this is pretty oh, funny. I see. But a lot of his callers didn't get it. They were very angry with him. <laughs> right, well... Obviously, he doesn't believe in capitalism. He doesn't believe in free minds and free markets, or else he wouldn't be such a strong opponent of the drug war. And he wouldn't be supporting a president that has made government so much larger than it was when he took office. Wait, do you mean he's a proponent of the drug war? Is that what 
Yeah, yeah, Sean Hannity. And in fact, uh, during the campaign, when I would appear on his show, he very frequently would say, "Harry Brown, you have a lot of good ideas. If you guys would just get rid of this opposition to the drug war, you probably would make a lot more progress in politics. You probably would make a bigger impact. But you're so ridiculous on this drug war thing." That... Well, this is why I'm not a conservative, and um, it's because of things like, like, like I say, when Sean Hannity wants to criticize shows, socialism, I'm with him. You know. But sure. On the other hand, my brother, who I think is still uh, tends to be liberal. He thinks that the Libertarian Party would be great if if, if the Libertarian Party just weren't so pro gun. Uh, gun sure. Right, you know? Okay, we've got to take got to take a break. Thanks so much Thank for you. calling, Rob. And then before we go back to the phones, let me just mention about that Sean Hannity business in the drug war. When Sean Hannity would say on the radio to me that you Libertarians would make a lot more progress if you would just give up your opposition to the drug war. I would usually answer to him, I think you're right, Sean. If we would just lie about what we believe, if we would just give up our principles, in other words, if we would just be more like Republicans, I'm sure we would do a lot better. Is that what you're suggesting? And that usually would shut him up on that. But you might keep that in mind when people tell you that libertarians are too extreme, the libertarians should be more moderate in what they want, and that uh, if we were, we might be more successful, or that libertarians should be more accommodating. We shouldn't be asking for the end of Medicare and the end of Social Security and the end of all these fraudulent government programs, but rather just that they be reformed or that they be reduced or whatever. All you have to answer is, in other words, you think we should give up our principles. You think we should be in favor of government using force to take from some and give to others. And the fact of the matter is that whenever you give government power to do anything, you're giving the government power to do everything. There is no such thing as a little bit of government like a little bit of pregnancy. As long as government has its foot in the door, you know that that foot's going to get larger and larger and the door is going to get further and further open. So there is no hope for a moderate change. There is no hope for reform. But there is hope for intelligent life out in the United States, and as proof of that, we're going to talk with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Hey, Harry. How are you doing? I'm just fine. How are you? Good. Uh, I just wanted to quickly respond to uh, something that Rob said a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. He said that he thought that you made a lot of sense and that the libertarian position on foreign policy made a lot of sense, but he thought that it also made sense that these people in the Middle East do uh, not like American um, culture, and I think that is... Uh, certainly true, but something that he's missing is that there may be many people in the Middle East who dislike American culture because they think it's decadent and what have you, but disliking American culture for that reason is not a necessarily a motivation for... To go bomb them. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> it's not an excuse to kill people. <laughs> the fact is that the Warhawks need people to accept the premise that it's American, the American way of life that is the sole motivation for these attacks, because... Unless people, if people accept that premise, then their only options are, well, we either have to give up our way of life, which we love, or we have to go destroy every, everyone else in the world who doesn't share our appreciation for that way of life. Which, which do you want, Jonathan? Which of those are you going to choose? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, not, well, most Americans don't think either one is, is a, good, uh, a good bargain. I but, don't either, but, but, but I don't here, think those are the alternatives. I'm but, Jonathan, sure. here again is the value in Pinchon's statement that if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't care what your answers are. And as long as they can put it on that either-or basis, uh, as you've suggested, then they don't care who wins the argument. Uh, should, uh, should we give up our freedoms here, or should we go bomb them there? Either way, they come out ahead, so they've gotten us to ask, ask the wrong questions. So you really put your finger on it. Exactly. And, and I, think, I think it's important for, for we libertarians and, and uh, people who understand the situation not to concede that premise, that that is the motivation behind what has happened. Because once you do that, you're, you're putting yourself in, in a position where you're going to uh, have to backpedal a lot. Whereas if you say, well, how come terrorism, America has always been a uh, well more, way more prosperous and way more democratic than the Middle Eastern region, and yet terrorism is, a, is just a, a relatively recent uh, phenomenon in that it was never a widespread concern decades ago. Um, you can really put it, make them think about, make people think about, well, maybe that's not the reason, and that the reason is something else, and that something obviously, as he pointed out over and over again, is the um, is, is a foreign policy conducted by our government, and I think it's important that we also put the blame on politicians rather than just say America in general. Definitely, definitely. It is very, very important to keep referring to what our government has done, not to what America has done. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's that, basically that, the point that I wanted to uh, make. Well, it's a very good point. And as far as these Iraqis that Bush keeps saying, see, they hate freedom, and that's why they're doing this, the question is, so what? So what if they do hate freedom? What business is it of ours? What do we care if there are Iraqis who hate freedom? We shouldn't be there to be trying to impose freedom on people. And it's just simply no business of ours. And if we minded our own business, we wouldn't care if they just hated America with a passion, as long as we had some kind of defense. And, of course, we have no defense whatsoever because our entire military establishment, all $600 billion of it, is focused on offense. Absolutely. But the, but the important thing to remember is that the, the choice isn't that we destroy everyone in the world who doesn't like freedom or we give up uh, American uh, po American culture and American prosperity. Uh, we can have a peaceful and free country 
without everyone in the world agreeing with us. Mm-hmm. And if we expect to destroy every uh, nation or every government in the world that is a, a dictatorship before we can finally have peace and prosperity, it's never going to happen. Yeah, very good, very good. And, of course, uh, Switzerland, who is surrounded, has been surrounded by hostile powers and warring nations, has managed to stay peaceful without getting into a war for 200 years. And they haven't had to give up their freedom to do it. They haven't had to give up their prosperity or their so-called democracy. Thank you so much for calling, Jonathan. Thanks. Let's take some emails very quickly. Dave out there in cyberspace says, okay, what do you say we should do next? I do not need a rehash of how bad it is. Oh, come on, Dave, let me give you one more rehash of how bad it is. But what do we do next? First of all, the first step always, and you probably passed that already, is don't support the people who are giving you war, who are giving you a bigger government, and so on. Secondly, just keep talking. Keep pointing out the truth wherever you know what the truth is and wherever you can do it without sacrificing yourself. I'm not asking you to be a martyr, but keep the truth alive. That's very, very important. A year ago, it seemed as though there was no way that we could stop this Bush juggernaut of going into one country after another after another. As soon as I got done with Iraq, Syria or Libya or somebody else was obviously going to be next. And you just have to keep the truth alive, and then the next thing you know, things begin to turn the other way. They haven't turned around completely, but look at all the skepticism that is now being leveled against the Bush administration, all of the second thoughts that people are giving about whether we should have gone to war. You know what? During the First World War, there were vigilante groups that went out, painted people's houses yellow, painted people yellow because they opposed the war or they opposed the draft, and it seemed as though this hysteria was going to go on forever. And yet, it wasn't very long after the war was over that people began to rethink the whole idea of the war. The average person began to to ask questions like, what in the world did we get in that war for? None of the things that Woodrow Wilson said were going to happen as a result of this war have happened. And the 1920s were a reaction against that. Uh, Warren Harding was elected on what they called a return to normal. But in 1917 or 1918, you couldn't believe there was any way out of this hysteria that had gripped the country. And it wasn't just anti-German hysteria. It was, it was a hysteria that if you did not toe the line with a 100% so-called Americanism position, which was no more American, of course, than Nazi Germany or, or Soviet Russia, but if you didn't toe this line, then you needed to lose your job, you needed to lose your rights, you needed to lose everything else, and you could even be sent to prison for talking against the government. But that did pass. And if we keep the truth alive, we can hope that events will transpire that because of what we have said will help people to see that these events are an indication that we were right. A message from someone else in cyberspace. I've heard many rumors and read a few articles on lourockwell.com about how John Kerry is an even bigger hawk on foreign policy than Bush is. If this turns out to be true and John Kerry is elected, do you think by 2008, due to his disastrous foreign policies that he will no doubt put into effect, a big enough political sea change, if you will, will take place to put libertarians in power? I would not count on that, but as far as him being a big hawk is concerned, read the article on my Radio Links page. It's from two or three weeks ago, an article by John Pilger, pointing out that you should not think of Democrats as being anti-war, that it really doesn't matter whether Kerry or Bush is elected, this country is still in foreign policy trouble. John Kerry is not going to bring the troops home any more than Bill Clinton did. John Kerry is not going to stop sticking our government's nose in the business of other countries any more than George Bush did. And so I would not count on that. As to whether this will bring about widespread disgust, it is possible, but it is not something I would count on. It's going to be up to us. It's going to be up to us to continue to talk wherever we can. And it isn't so much the number of people we convince, but the fact that you never know who might be the recipient of what you have to say. When I speak on the radio, of course, I don't know who's listening. But it's the same for you. When you write a letter to the editor or you call into a radio show, you don't know who is actually going to hear this. And it may be somebody who is very influential. It may be somebody who's got a lot more money than you do, a lot more connections than you do, a lot more power or pull than you have. And he may have required just what you had to say to put him over the line where he says, by God, that's it. There, that guy's right. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm going to use my influence to try to do something about it. And it's true even if you're not writing letters to the editor or calling into radio stations, just talking to people. You don't know whom you might push over that line, who in turn will push somebody else over the line to turn them into an anti-war or libertarian activist. Jim in Norristown, Pennsylvania, says you have to give credit to the Bush administration for the recent success. By reluctantly letting Rice testify before Congress, they captured the headlines for several days. And while she was advertising the Bush agenda, Iraq was exploding into a new level of violence. U.S. forces even dropped a 500-pound bomb on a mosque killing the civilian worshippers. Abroad, pictures of piles of bodies and wounded children filled the TV. The new alliance between the Sunnis and Shiites was barely mentioned. I understand that the last alliance between these two factions was formed to fight the British occupation in the 1920s. Bush's smokescreen was swallowed by all the press, including the BBC and NPR. While everyone was busy asking what did Bush know and when, they were too busy to ask if there were foreign policy mistakes that led to the events of 9-11. They were too preoccupied to ask if the brutal sanctions in Iraq or military aid to Israel had anything to do with the rage against America abroad. 
what happened to the free press? Why won't they ask the right questions? Well, the reason I think they don't ask the right questions is because they are generally big government. More than being liberal or conservative or Democrat or Republican, most people in the press are in favor of big government. And that's why they would take the side of Clinton when he was promoting a big health care program. They took the side of Bush when he was promoting a big war in Iraq, because both of them are big government programs. But you are bringing out a, an important point. There was terrible fighting this past week that really got very little reporting, and a lot of Americans died. One more point with regard to the question about what do we do. The fact is that you, first and foremost, must enjoy the life that you have. There is no right to anything in this world. There is no guarantee of anything. You take the hand that is dealt you, as the expression goes. You live in the world as you find it. And this is the world we live in. So first and foremost, make it the best possible world for yourself and your family. And then do what you can to try to improve the broader world around you. But do not neglect your own life and your own family. Because someday it's all going to be over, and you don't want to look back and say, I spent my whole life fighting for something that never came about, when you could have made all kinds of changes in your own life that would have made yourself and the people most important to you happiest. Obviously, I want you and lots of other people to help try to make this a freer country, but I don't want you to sacrifice in doing it. And I want you to understand that I am not sacrificing. I am enjoying what I do, and I am making a living doing what I do. I'm doing it because I want America to be the kind of America it should be, but I'm also making sure that my wife and I live as well as we can and enjoyably as we can and to make the most of what there is in this world still, and there's so much still in America to be enjoyed. Please don't overlook that. Now, we've only got a few minutes left, but we've got a couple of other callers. Matt in California, could I get a statement from you very briefly or a quick question because we're almost out of time? Yeah, we can make it quick, Harry. How are you? I'm just fine. Great to talk to you. Um, Harry, I'm wondering what a uh, libertarian government or uh, would do about uh, car safety, and specifically I'm referring to SUVs that are trucks, and they are put in there because of lobbying. Um, now, they're fine for the person driving them, but they're a danger to other cars, and I'm wondering what, how a libertarian government would frame the rules to uh, change that. First of all, the federal government has no business making any rules about anything having to do with business in this country. It is not the federal government's job to make sure we're safe. It is our job to make sure we're safe, and because we want to be safe, car makers do everything they can to satisfy that desire for safety. Disc brakes, radial towers, shatterproof glass, cruise control, power steering, power brakes, all of these things came about not because government mandated them, but because automakers recognized that they would help to sell cars. And if there's a problem with SUVs, uh, that people are not protected from other people's SUVs, if the government would just get out of the way, then some, maybe some of the best minds in the country would find a way of satisfying people's desires for SUVs with other people's desires not to be put in danger by them. But I can assure you that no government by force is ever going to impose the answer to that question. And that's really all I can tell you, Matt. Uh, thank you for calling. Let me take Les real quick in Arizona. I appreciate your having hung on, but you only got about 30 seconds now, Les. I just wanted to point out one little hypocrisy. Our, our, I get on the news and they talk about the war in Iraq and so on. And mm -hmm. uh, we're going to impose a constitution on them and they're going to have a rule of law over there. And yet Article 1, Section 8, Clause 12 of our constitution says Congress shall have the power to declare war. We don't even follow our own rules. Every one of those men up there took, men and women took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. We don't even follow our own rules. We don't even follow our own basis for our government for the existence of this country. And I just find that we have surrendered the moral high ground in that, on that basis alone. And on that basis alone is why I'm in opposition to this thing. Very good. Jay Leno, the comedian, said, about using theirs? <laughs> yeah, said if they need a constitution, why don't we give them ours because we're not using it you anymore. Know, if, if the House voted 218 to 217 and the Senate 50 to 50 and then Vice President Cheney cast a tie-breaking vote and President Bush signed it into law, full-fledged declaration of war like Ron Paul has proposed and Bob Barr has proposed, I would oppose it up until that point, the declaration war. But once they did it, at least they followed the rules, and then I wouldn't really have a whole lot to say as far as opposition to it goes. Well, you could still oppose it, but you at least would right. recognize that they had done it legally instead right. of this way. And the idea that a year ago, October, they passed a resolution, and that was the equivalent to a declaration of war, is not true. What they did was they handed the president a blank check and said, you do whatever you want. Thanks for calling, Les. Thank you for listening this evening. Don't forget to tune in next week. This is Harry Brown. Have a terrific week. Good night. <laughs>